So the challenge with any new technology is how to do it right so you can trust and understand the results and how to keep it as local and affordable as possible. And I, I see them as a, as a real tension between the two. Probably the easiest, most cost efficient thing uh, to do is have hubs and central testing. So you just have to set up a few centers of excellence. But the truth is that samples then have to travel. Uh, and that's not always as easy as it sounds. You know, certainly we know for molecular testing that tissue can take a long time to go from one institution to the other. Blocks melt, things happen. Uh, and that would be very similar for liquid biopsies as well. So I think, you know, I think to start, it would probably need to be centralized to make sure that you've got the quality, uh, to make sure that you've got the bioinformatics. But I think what clinicians forget, you know, because there are all these off-the-shelf tests, we never really think about um, how good is this test? Could there be a false positive? We, that never occurs to us that something might be a false positive or some sort of internal PCR replication error. We need to think about those things. Things like what did we miss? So it's very important if you're using a, you know, an off-the-shelf assay or, develop, or your lab is developing it to think about things like you know, how sensitive is your assay in terms of picking up things like fusions and copy number gain, which are emerging as very, very important in lung cancer. I think the reliability for mutation testing is pretty good now for, for most assays. So, so we need to think about these things. The other thing for these commercial tests that I often worry about is um, they come back, there's a nice summary of what's there. Uh, they match you up with uh, therapies that are currently approved, for example, by the FDA that are either uh, on-label or off-label, and then a list of clinical trials. And it's, it's so important as a clinician that when you look at that, you, you know your patient with lung cancer and the, PI3, uh, the PIK3CA mutation probably isn't going to benefit from a trial that targets that, but they might benefit from a trial that targets something else. And so there's that extra bit of, of interpretation. Also, what do you do when you find multiple mutations that are actionable? What does that mean? Do you pick based on um, the allelic fraction or what's most likely to be actionable in that cancer? And so so these sorts of things are they're very challenging. There's not a lot of guidance or support out there for clinicians. So, you know, I'll often call the company if it's if it's a if it's a commercial test and say, you know, what does this mean? Uh, how do we do this, what could be missing. Hereditary variants, you know, I'll often send patients if I'm worried, I'll send them to, uh, to a genetics counselor to be assessed about whether that's important or not. Sometimes the report will say, you know, this could be a germline variant. Most of them don't, but it's important to ask. The other thing that's important is um, false positives. You know, TP53 mutations are so common, but they're not necessarily from the cancer in a liquid biopsy. So clonal hematopoiesis is important. Uh, and so again, I'll call the provider and say, you know, is this TP53 or JAK2 mutation or KRAS mutation real or from the tumor or, or is it from the white blood cells? And so, so I think it's really important to, to have that communication and to be thoughtful about that. One of the challenges we have in Canada, and I'm sure it's similar uh, in the UK, is because we don't have a lot of NGS that's available, it's just very small pockets where we do it, um, we don't have a lot of support. So that molecular tumor board and that access is a real challenge, but I think in the next one to two years, we really need to start ramping up that support for clinicians.